Okay, so in this chapter, we're gonna move on from job order costing. And here we're going to be looking at what is called process costing in a little bit more detail. Now we did preface this in the last chapter where we did a brief comparison between job order and process just to show us kind of where we were heading. So if you recall back in chapter 15, when we talked about job order costing, we said that we use job order costing primarily for very specific jobs that can't be automated very well, that are highly specialized, that are typically time consuming, all those types of things. It makes it very easy for us to trace the costs and trace the items that are actually used there to that individual job. So that was when we wanted to use job order costing. Now our focus shifts from that here in chapter 16 to process costing. And with process costing, we're essentially looking at the opposite situation. So when we look at process costing, what we're looking at is we will typically see this type of organizational method used whenever we have the production of identical units that are low cost items. So this is something like, I believe in the last chapter, the textbook used um, a water bottle manufacturer as the brief example. Here, I think this chapter uses tennis balls, but anything that can be mass produced. So we tend to think of things like water bottles and tennis balls and baseballs and footballs and anything like that, right? Anything that you can quickly produce over and over. So these are of course mass produced and typically automated continuous production processes. Costs are typically not able to be traced to each individual unit of the product. So if I'm producing 100 million water bottles a year, I may not necessarily care how much cost is in the plastic to produce that one water bottle. I probably just wanna know how much water, um, how much the overall plastic costs to produce all of those water bottles. And then we'll allocate that out in some way. And that's kind of what we'll start to see here in this chapter. Of course, this does tend to lend, to lend itself to a series of repetitive processes. And each process, of course, will apply direct materials, labor, and overhead as we move through the production process. Um, next, of course, we will see that final process will produce finished goods that, of course, will be ready for sale to the customers. So just a brief summary of kind of what we are seeing at a high level here. This top chart is the same exact picture we saw back in chapter 15. And that of course is showing us how we move through a job cost environment. So we walked through that back there. So I'm not gonna go over it again, but I am going to walk you through this bottom system, which is of course that process system, because this is the first time we're seeing this chart here in chapter 16. So what you'll notice here is we apply our direct materials, labor and overhead, but to each individual area, one piece at a time. Now, one very important thing you're going to want to notice is up in that job order costing system, we have exactly one work in process inventory account. But under process costing, we tend to have more than one work in process inventory account. So here we have work in process inventory for the core department, which is where they build the core piece that goes in the center of the tennis ball. Then once that piece is complete, once we've built the actual core, we'll send this over to the next work in process department, which is of course the felt department. So this is where they actually put the felt on the outside of the tennis ball that gives it that classic tennis ball feel. Then once that is done, now you've got a complete tennis ball, but we don't sell them unpackaged, right? Out on in the open typically, they typically come in some type of container. Maybe we sell them in threes or twelves or some amount, but they normally come packaged in some form or another. So of course now we send all of these individually produced tennis balls through to the next step, which is packaging. At this point, we will take the completed tennis balls, put them in their packages, and then move them out of this area into that finished goods inventory where they can now be sold. So that is what the process is. And you'll notice that at each step along the way, we're simply moving from one work in process inventory account to another. So just like in chapter 15, where we said inventory necessarily isn't accurate enough because we realized, well, now we've got things like raw materials inventory and work in process inventory and finished goods inventory. Well, now just work in process inventory isn't going to be enough because we've now got different work in process accounts that we have to actually differentiate between. So we wanna be very careful as we work through these problems to make sure that we're correctly identifying the accounts that we are using. So, here we go. First thing that needs to happen is as we form those rubber cores, we've got to do a couple of things. So the journal entry here, 
once we have completed the cores, we are moving from our initial department, which is that core department, through to the felt department. So at this point, the felt department inventory needs to be increasing. And at the same time, that core department inventory should be coming down. So we're gonna keep using that same rule we first started using back in chapter 15, which is we debit where we are going to in these inventory transactions, and we credit where we are coming from. So in this case, we are going to the felt department from the core department. That explains why our debit is to the work and process inventory felt department as we are now moving there, but we are coming from this core department because the work there is now complete. At this point, once we have finished gluing the felt covers onto the cores, well now we no longer need to be sitting in the felt department, so we need to debit where we are now going to, which is of course the packaging department. So I will debit the work and process inventory dash packaging department, indicating that that is where we are now sending these to. And I will credit work and process inventory felt department to indicate that that is where this is coming from. Now the last step here is once we have finished packaging the tennis balls, they now need to go somewhere. So the location where they will end up at this point in time is that finished goods inventory account. You'll notice there's only one finished goods inventory account because now everything has been complete. So there's no need for separate finished good inventory accounts here. So we simply debit finished goods inventory. And once again, we credit where we are coming from, which in this case, of course, is that packaging department from work in process inventory. So we do see that similar flow to what we saw back in chapter 15. Now, one of the main ideas in this chapter is this idea of equivalent units of production. It will be the driving force behind the vast majority of calculations in chapter 16. So you really wanna make sure you understand how this works. So what this tells us, what equivalent units of production tells us is just simply the number of units we would have completed if we had only completed complete units during the period. Restated, this tells us that if we had 10,000 tennis balls enter production, and at the end of the period, they were all 30% done. Well, if I had only completed completed units, then I would have completed a total of 3,000 tennis balls. The total of the 10,000 physical units times that 30% that is done. So the 10,000 times the 30% would come out to 3,000 equivalent units of production. So that's all we're saying here. So the textbook just defines this as the number of units that could have been started and completed during the period given the costs incurred. So exactly what we said. As long as you take the physical number of units times that percentage complete, that will tell you how many units you could have totally finished. So let's see how this works. In this case, we are given a situation where all of our direct materials are added in at the beginning of production. And you say, well, how can you tell that just from this chart? And you can tell that because for direct materials, so that very first row we see equivalent units of production for direct materials. So notice this is the row we're talking about. And we are told that these are 100% complete. So we have 10,000 physical units that have received 100% of their direct materials. For that reason, as far as direct materials go, I have 10,000 equivalent units of production. But notice that is not the case for my direct labor and overhead. So in this case, at the end of the period, my direct labor and overhead is only 20% complete. So instead of having 10,000 equivalent units here, I have 10,000 physical units times that 20% complete, which gives us a total of 2,000 equivalent units for both direct labor and overhead. So this is how this is going to be working. And this is something we're going to be seeing a time and again throughout this chapter. Get used to this formula, this basic setup, because we'll be using it in almost every question in this chapter. So definitely something you want to be aware of. Now, in this chapter, your textbook does cover two different methods here for dealing with this item of process costing. Now, truthfully, in this course, we could cover both methods. If we should have time, we may decide to cover both methods, but I will certainly make you aware of that if that decides or if that does become the case. If you are at all confused on that, please let me know. But intentionally, our starting point in this, in this course 
is going to be focused on this weighting on this weighted average method. So it is not my intention at this time to cover the FIFO method in here. I want to make sure we really understand weighted average and that should be good enough for an introductory course. Should you be an accounting major or accounting minor and you are looking at moving into future cost accounting courses, it would certainly be worth your time to read through the FIFO information found at the end of the chapter and in the appendix and come by my office. I'll be happy to walk you through those items as well. But for the main portion of the course, for the vast majority of students, the weighted average method is sufficient to give you a good understanding of how this works. Um, that said, it is included in the main chapter. So if we do have extra time, we could end up discussing FIFO, but truthfully, it is not at the top of the list as far as I'm concerned at this point. So we will skip over anything in this lecture dealing with the FIFO method and instead focus primarily on those weighted average items. So the next thing we wanna look at is describe accounting for production activities and the preparation of what is called a process cost summary under the weighted average method. So here we are told we have a couple of steps we need to follow. So the first step of course is going to be to determine the physical flow of units. So step one is to determine the physical flow. So determine physical flow. Step two, we want to compute equivalent units of production. If I am writing anything in class, I will always abbreviate this as EUP for equivalent units of production. I simply am not going to take the time to write that out. That is an abbreviation you certainly want to commit to memory. Number three here, our next step of course, is to do what we call computing cost per equivalent unit of production. So if I ever write this, it'll be either dollars over EUP or cost over EUP, because that is simply a better way to write this. And then finally, our fourth and last step here is to assign and reconcile those costs so that we can see that everything has been properly accounted for. So this is the process we're going to look at. Now here is just a graph or a visual depiction of how a firm might be set up with different areas, of course, labeled for you. I don't think this bears any direct interest to the actual accounting. This is really just to help you place things in your mind. So if this is something that you want to look at in your own time, feel free to pause the video or look it up in your textbook. It's of course exhibit 16.4, but I'm not going to waste time identifying what the different parts are in here as I simply don't think it would be a good use of our time. I want to try to be respectful of your time in these videos. So the next thing we want to look at is how this is actually going to work in terms of equivalent units. So here we go. First thing I want to point out here is one of the main things you need to consider as you work through this. Notice at the beginning of the period, in this case March 31st, so our ending inventory for March of course becomes our beginning inventory in April. So we essentially have here our inventory as of April the 1st. So we've got 30,000 units, then we started 90,000 units in the month of April. So that means in total we have a total number of units of 120,000 going through this process somewhere. Now at the end of the month, I need to be accounting for a total of 120,000 units. Now where can those units be? Well, they can either be completed and transferred out or they can be uncomplete or incomplete and still be an ending work in process inventory. So they've got to be in one of those two places. And what that tells me then is that the sum of those two items, my units completed and transferred out during the month, and my ending work in process inventory should total back to that same 120,000 units. And of course, we do see that being the case here because we do see our 100,000 plus our 20 being equal to 120 and our 30 plus the 90 also being equal to 120. So you can tell then that we were able to keep track of all of our physical units, which is very important. Now, the next thing we wanna notice is what is called percentage of completion. Now notice here with direct materials, we are 100% complete. And so for that reason, we're going to pull down the 100%. Now for conversion, we are only 65% complete all the way through to 25% at our ending work in process. Now you'll notice of course, for our units completed and transferred, they were 100% complete for both direct materials and conversion, which makes sense of course, because in order to be transferred, they must be finished units. So in that column, you do see the two 100%. For direct materials, it does appear as though 
all direct materials are added at the beginning of the process, so they're at 100%, whereas our conversion costs, of course, come in typically uniformly throughout the production process. So at the end of March, we were 65% done. At the end of April, we were 25% done with the units that remained. So the way this, of course, is going to work is we're simply going to pull down the information that we need. Now, in this graphic, they don't actually give us um, enough information to really be able to calculate everything. So they do go through in the textbook where all of these numbers come from. I certainly think it is worth um, reviewing there. Um, but in class, we will go through several examples where we actually pull down the numbers and actually figure things out. But as far as this video is concerned, I just want you to see how these things tend to move together, just so we can have a decent starting point as we work problems during the class. So let's continue then. If I can get it to go. There we go. So first things first, we need to move through our first step, which is, of course, determining that physical flow of units. So you'll notice the units to account for should always, of course, equal out to the units that were accounted for. So in this case, we have beginning work and process inventory of 30,000 units plus the 90,000 units that were started, which is our 120. That, of course, equals out to our 100,000 units that were completed and transferred plus our 20,000 units in ending work and process to prove to us that we have reconciled this properly in terms of physical units. Now, the next thing we need to look at is actually computing what is called our equivalent units of production. So in this case, this very top row, every time I suggest, should be the equivalent units that are completed and transferred as it is by far the easiest row to complete. All you have to do here is go back, realize that you completed and transferred 100,000 units. That 100,000 units pulls straight in as your number of whole units complete and transferred to the next department. Then because they were completed and transferred, you know that the percentage of the work done here was 100% every single time. Well, 100,000 times 100% is, of course, 100,000. Now we need to go back and look at our equivalent units for those units in ending work in process. So in this case, we see we've got 20,000 units in our ending work in process account. We can also go back and see that if we look here, our 100% completion occurs for our direct materials, while 25% completion occurs for our conversion. So that is where this 100% and 25% come through respectively. That tells us then we've got 20,000 equivalent units of production for direct materials and only 5,000 equivalent units of production for conversion cost. Then we simply add down our columns and we come up with our total equivalent units of production for each category. So here we have 120,000 equivalent units of production for direct materials and 105,000 equivalent units of production or EUPs for conversion costs. Now, we have dealt with our second step, which is, of course, to compute equivalent units of production, which is a necessary step to be able to do the third item here, which is to, of course, compute the cost per equivalent unit. So in the reading in the chapter, they tell us that our cost of beginning work and process inventory was $81,000, and that during the period, we incurred $279,000 in additional direct materials. This tells us my total cost of direct materials then it's 81,000 plus 279, which is of course 360. 360 over 120, of course, comes out to even $3 per equivalent unit of production. Now we'll do the same type math over here for conversion. Once again, in the reading, they tell us, then we come out to $108,900 plus 376, 200 for a total of 485, 100, divided by 105,000 equivalent units of production, comes out to $4.62. So you'll notice this 120 and the 105, of course, are coming from our previous step, which is why it is so important to properly compute your equivalent units of production here in step two. Now, finally, we need to deal with the assignment of our costs. So we see here the cost of units completed and transferred to the blending department included 100,000 equivalent units of production, so we see that, of course, back goes right here. This is our 100,000 equivalent units of production for both of these items times their respective cost per equivalent unit. That gives us a total then of $762,000. We now look once again 
at our partial equivalent units, so our 20,000 and our 5,000, which of course come in multiplied by their respective amounts, and we get a total here of 83,100. 83, one plus 762 comes out to $845,100, which is the total cost we have accounted for. And in the reading, we can actually tell that the total cost to account for were also $845,100. This allows us to see that our process costing summary actually does reconcile and proves to us that there's a very good chance we have completed this form correctly. So while we did this in each individual step, this is what the overall product will of course look like. So very useful report, one you certainly want to be able to prepare as you get ready for the exam. Now here they give us the general cost data, of course, for Gen X, which I believe is where a lot of those numbers we were just using actually are coming from and is essentially what we will be using to prepare many of the journal entries we are about to look at. So here we look at our accounting for material costs. So in this first journal entry, we see that this is our, us acquiring materials on credit for use of the factory. So of course, like any time we purchase inventory, this will result in a debit to an inventory account. Specifically in this case, it tells us this was for materials so we will be debiting raw materials inventory. That account, of course, is an asset and is increasing with a debit. Now with accounts payable, that is, of course, a liability, which increases with a credit. Now, once we move out of raw materials inventory, we must apply those materials to individual areas of the organization. So it looks like both the roasting and blending departments have used some raw materials this period. So we will debit those individually, of course, a debit to work and process inventory roasting for the materials used by that department, and a debit to work and process inventory blending for the raw materials used by that department. Now, of course, the full amount of those raw materials must come out of that raw materials inventory account. So we'll simply credit that for the full amount. Now we simply come down, we need to record the indirect materials that were used in April. So we will be debiting factory overhead here, of course, for the actual amount as a debit represents actual and a credit represents applied. So we are debiting factory overhead for actual overhead incurred of 71,250 and crediting raw materials inventory for $71,250. Now we need to look at how we handle the labor items. So, here, of course, we need to record factory wages for the month. So we are paying that. So we are debiting factory wages payable to remove that liability. And we are crediting cash, of course, to represent the payment. Now, on step number five, we see a debit here to work and process inventory roasting for 171, a debit to work and process inventory blending for the 183, following up here with a credit to factory wages payable for the amount of $354,160, setting up the need to, of course, pay that in the next month. Finally, we need to deal with our indirect labor. So of course here we are debiting factory overhead and crediting factory wages payable. So that is of course what we see in this case. Okay. Now moving on, we are going to look at the factory overhead costs. So here we are, of course, recording our actual overhead in our first entry, and of course we are recording our applied overhead in our second. So here we have our actual items that in were incurred. So we had some prepaid insurance expire. We had utilities payable, of course, come up. We had paid some cash, and we had some accumulated depreciation. We then add all of this up and get the amount of 262,400. Now for our application, it tells us here, we apply overhead costs to production departments at the rate of 120% of direct labor costs. So if you flip back, you will see that our direct labor costs of 171 and 183 will be taken by 120%. So those two by 120% by are multiplied by 120% give you the 205, 200 and the 219, 792. Adding those two together comes out to 424, 992 and of course is our credit to factory overhead. Now, the next thing we wanna look at, of course, is the transfer of goods between departments to finished goods inventory and finally the cost of goods sold. So initially we need to transfer 100,000 units from the roasting department to the blending department. So 
So you'll remember way back when we did that process costing report, we found that the total cost that should have been transferred out of finished goods in, or I'm sorry, to the next apartment here was $762,000. So that's where that number is coming from. So it's simply debit work in process inventory blending, credit to work in process inventory roasting, indicating we are transferring from the roasting department to the blending department. Next, we wanna look at our subsequent journal entry here, 9B, where we are actually moving from the blending department to, through to finished goods inventory. And that is of course for the 1,262,940. Now finally, we need to deal with the goods that were actually sold. So we will be debiting cost of goods sold, moving them from the balance sheet through to the income statement and crediting that finished goods inventory account, moving them out of course of finished goods inventory. Now, here at the end of this chapter, there are a few topics that we like to talk about. Um, these are covered a little bit more in depth in your textbook, but I'll briefly discuss each one here, just so you have a surface level understanding if your textbook hasn't come in yet, or if you have um, some issues accessing it. So of course, here with process design, management is typically concerned with production efficiency. So we're trying to design our processes in a way that help us be as efficient as possible. A just-in-time production philosophy we talk about at a little bit more length previously in 231 or 2301, but briefly here then, um, the real goal here with a just-in-time production mentality is to minimize any inventory on hand. The good thing here is that it lets you avoid any inventory carrying costs or float costs. The downside, of course, is if you have something crazy like an international pandemic that shuts down supply lines, it can lead to you not having enough inventory on hand to meet new customers' demands or current existing customers' needs, which can of course lead to the loss of current sales, but possibly even future sales. So while it can be extremely profitable, it can also be extremely risky. Next, of course, robotics and automation, I don't think needs a whole lot of explanation. This is really just us trying to improve efficiency by automating certain repetitive tasks so that people don't have to do those anymore. This can help cut down on direct labor costs but we can also automate some of the more dangerous aspects of jobs and improve the welfare of our employees by doing so. Next, we see continuous processing. This is, of course, when materials are continuously moving through production. Um, you might see this with something like Pepsi manufacturer as they're producing bottles of soda. And there's probably not a lot of downtime, right? You produce the bottle, the bottle hits on the line, it rolls down, it gets filled up with the soda, it then moves down to packaging and goes right out the door. There's not a whole lot of downtime in that process. Next, we see services, of course. Um, services may use process operations. So for example, in the last chapter when we were talking about job order costing, we also talked about services. And I can actually use the same example we used then. So in the last chapter, we were talking about job order costing. As we said, for things like a tax return, you probably want that costed as the consumer under a job order costing model. And that may be fine especially if you've got a very complex tax return, I or my accounting firm, for example, would certainly want to cost that respective of the amount of time it took us to actually complete the return. So if it takes us three full days or 20, 30 hours to complete your tax return, then we should probably charge you more than somebody's tax return that we can complete in 30 minutes. So you do see that difference and that seems to make sense to us. But on the same hand, if I've got a bunch of returns that I think I can do in less than an hour, I probably don't wanna sit here and have to keep really detailed records of exactly what I did for 18 minutes or 24 minutes or whatever it is. So I may have a flat rate for a very simple return. For example, if all you've got is a W-2 and a 1099, then I might tell you, well, I can prepare your tax return for $50 or $100, whatever it is, and that's that. Right? You agree to it, I agree to it, and we move on and we kind of avoid the diligent note taking that has to happen under this, um, this job order type system. So you can certainly see how in either case, right, if I'm doing a ton of very simple, but mostly repetitive tax returns, I can do those in a more process style than I can a um, job order style. So the next item here, of course, is customer orientation. Essentially give the customer what they want, um, try to figure out ways that we can improve the product to better meet our customers' needs. And of course, the last item here is yield. And this is another one that primarily deals with efficiency of operations. So the way we're going to actually calculate yield is we simply take the amount of material and that is the actual output divided by the amount of material that was actually put in. So for example, if I'm actually producing 
a unit, say I'm using peanuts, which is the example the textbook uses, and I input 10,000 pounds of peanuts, but after I'm done roasting and everything, I only get out, say, 9,800 pounds, then my yield is 98%. You say, well, what happened to the 2%? Well, maybe we burnt them in roasting. Maybe they fell off the conveyor belt and got ruined. Maybe someone stepped on them or stole some of them. So we do need to keep an eye on this yield. It doesn't necessarily have to be at 100% all the time. We're going to have some mistakes, but I certainly want to notice if, we're, if we start hitting a disturbing trend and my yield is continually declining. I mean, that would certainly be something I would want to keep a close watch on. Um, with that, um, we've got our very last item here, which is, which is, of course, a hybrid costing system. These are not two systems that have to be entirely one way or the other. You can actually have a hybrid, which is somewhere in the middle of a job order costing system and a process costing system. So it will certainly have features of both systems. So that is, of course, a possibility. Um, this, of course, occurs when companies try to standardize as much as they can to help improve efficiency and cut cost, but they're also trying to meet customers' needs. So if you have us do something special for your order, then it might make sense that we charge you a little bit more than somebody who just orders the absolute standard product. And so that is exactly what we see. And with this type of system, we certainly want to make sure to try to monitor and control any cost incurred. Now, the rest of the chapter at this point shifts over to a discussion of FIFO. And for this course, we had said that we were not going to discuss FIFO in any real depth, at least initially, or right? if we have extra time and we can fit it in, then certainly we may. Um, but in this video, we will not be covering FIFO. So with that, that of course is the end of this video. So we have now finished our third chapter, which means our first exam is right around the corner. So make sure you are getting prepared for that. Once again, if you have any questions, please never hesitate to contact me. I'm always happy to try to help clear up anything to help you understand what is actually happening um, during all of this accounting. So if you ever need me, feel free to come by my office, shoot me an email or set up a Zoom meeting. I'm always happy to help. I uh, uh, hope y'all found this video helpful. If it wasn't too bad, we'll see you in class. Thank you.